Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. These are the texts for September 5th, 2021, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. The continuous Old Testament reading, or not continuous, complementary, is Isaiah 35, 4 through 7a. Say good things about it in a complimentary way. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Proverbs 22, 1 through 2, 8 through 9, 22 through 23. Psalm 146. The epistle reading is James 2, 1 through 17. And from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. The story of the so-called Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, followed by the, uh, the man in the Decapolis. So Decapolis man, uh, I'll call him that. This is unique to Mark, this 31 to 37. There isn't a parallel in Matthew and Luke, is there? I don't think there is. I wasn't told there'd be a quiz. No, I find that or I find math. I was told there'd be no math. Oh, what? 31 to 37? Parallel. Oh, parallel. Oh, like parallel lines. Yeah. No, I believe Matthew 15. Matthew 15 has it? Oh, okay. Um, Does this affect our preaching? No. No, I guess not. I guess <laughs> well, you could argue that there's no parallel to the Syrophoenician woman because Matthew so greatly changes the story of the Canaanite woman. That's true. But yeah. nevertheless, anyway. and Luke decides to ignore it altogether, which is also interesting. That is very interesting. Yes, so only in Matthew and, and Mark. And uh, yeah, this is... My bad. What? Sorry. <laughs> the Matthew version is more of a summary. I would not call it a parallel. Yeah, I, was... okay, yeah, I thought it was unique. So I... The part, hardest part of this is saying F the th. <laughs> There's a town in Pennsylvania called that. Ephatha? Yes. Ephatha. Close. Ephatha. Where, it, where, where should we place, place the syllable? This one's going really well so far. I think. I know. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's move on. All right. So, well, I thought, uh, yeah, I thought it was unique to um, Mark. So we'll, we'll get to that because I think that's significant for interpreting it. But first we need to do the, the Syrophoenician woman. And, you know, I think we were, we were talking about this uh, before we got started, but this text, preachers just, let's just say right out front that I know all y'all want to save Jesus, but you can't. No saving Jesus. You cannot save Jesus in this. If you are going to say, oh, he didn't really mean that, or he wasn't really a slur, or you know, what he meant to say was, or, you know, it's little dogs or whatever. You can't, it's a puppy. You just can't. You, you really have to take this uh, passage to recognize the extraordinary moment that this woman gets Jesus to see the potential of his ministry and just how far it's going to go and how far it needs to go. And, uh, and of course, they're in the region of Tyre, which is way up north of Galilee, geography maven, here she is. And, uh, and uh, which makes the other geography piece in 31 a little bit weird because you can't go by way of Sidon, but that's beside the point, or maybe it isn't, I don't know. So entire, and then it's the levels of kind of um, the, how far this stone is getting thrown, you know, in terms of tire, a woman, Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, just that emphasis of this is this is absolutely Jesus is in Gentile territory, and he's talking with a Gentile woman, and it's her that uh, that says, "Jesus, you need to know exactly <laughs> what uh, the the possibility and potential for why you are here." Um, and I just I think that's it's an extraordinary passage in that regard. And anybody, any preacher who tries to limit her agency uh, or to discount uh, what Jesus acknowledges about her for saying this word is the, little, the literal Greek tautos, 
toss, uh, ton log on, right? Or two ton, ton log on. Uh, for saying this word, you may go. And, um, and that, that exchange and that, that recognition of, of, of here, is this, here is this Gentile woman who acknowledges and sees Jesus' authority, Jesus' power, but Jesus, you know, the, the breadth and depth of what this is, what this means, where, how far the kingdom of God will go. So that's, that's my first long comment. Yeah, I agree with everything. And it, of course, it's then demonstrated by where he goes next to so the Decapolis <clears throat> and among exactly. whom he ministers. So it appears to set him on, him. A, <clears throat> on a new he course. It yeah, does he doesn't go him. back to Capernaum. He doesn't go back. I think that's a really important point. And maybe that's what the Sidon thing is doing there, even though you don't, you know what I mean? Like it's yep. such an interesting, because get out your handy dandy Bible map. Sidon is north of Tyre. So he's going north to Sidon and then down to, you know, down to the capitalist, which is on the southeast side of, you know, of Galilee. So that is such a critical point, Matt, is that it, it, it changes where he's going to go. It resets his, his mission. Uh, he doesn't go back to Capernaum. He doesn't go back to Galilee. He does that. And I just think that is just Woo! Yeah. Fantastic. He's rerouted. She changes. Rerouted. Him. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I love that. Jesus gets rerouted by yes. her. There you go. There's a title for you. I, I yeah. agree with everything that you said. I, I, I think that it's, um, I agree with the can't saving Jesus. I, I, I've made a lot of people really angry teaching this passage before because people hold on to certain views around that that are hard to let go. And, and mm -hmm. so let's just talk about that at some point in time. It's also a parable that's really hard. The solution for a lot of people is to say, well, Jesus was really rude here and uses a slur. But that just kind of shows how he was a person of his time because that's how Jews back then talked. So, I mean, oh. the defense for some people is to slip into a kind of, well, all Jews were in our bigots, therefore, you know, and that's yeah. also not helpful to anybody. Right. Um, need to pay attention to power differential here. He is in her territory on her turf, so to speak. Even though she's a woman, uh, she might have significant more kind of cultural capital than he does. The fact that she's described as Greek suggests something about culture, might suggest something about wealth as well. I mean, it, so that uh -huh. it's so many things are are not the way they're usually in Mark's gospel here. So it's there's a lot we don't know, but we do know that her argument or her retort changes something. And we also know that her argument is based not so much on give me the dignity I deserve, but come on, man, you got plenty. <laughs> You've got enough grace or enough power to spare. And there's no need to wait because I'm not asking for a place of honor at the table. I'm not asking for special treatment. I just want you to realize that all the feeding work you're doing back in chapter six, when you fed the 5,000 plus creates leftovers, creates more. And so one of the things that she does is she accelerates his ministry because his answer to him isn't necessarily no. His answer to her initially is not yet. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. and she just blows that up. And so it's an interesting story about timing and how it accelerates time and accelerates both the scope of Jesus' ministry in ways that I I, I simply can't read this in any way that doesn't put the responsibility for that on her and her cleverness or her insight or her faith, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I think that that's a really interesting, that's an important point too. I'm so glad you brought that up about the acceleration of time, which is, um, which you can is interesting. both parties at once. Yeah. So yeah, again. which, well, which is interesting when you think of Mark, the general kind of tone or, or ethos of Mark of that urgency, right? It's like Jesus needs to be reminded of the scope and also the urgency of his, of his ministry. Um, and that, which, you know, which is, lies behind um, the gospel of Mark of mm -hmm. that. To what know, extent? That, it, that immediately. To what extent, uh, because we're in chapter seven, Peter hasn't made his confession yet. I mean, just to situate it, 
in the broader narrative, you know, we're still in the first half here that you're getting these, um, you're getting these um, Gentiles recognizing something of the salvation that he has to bring um, that uh, you're getting Romans uh, recognizing it in the first part of Mark, I think, if I remember right, you're getting obviously Jews recognizing it, but people don't know who he is yet here, but they do recognize that he brings a form of deliverance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which is, which is all part of a Mark but, and theme. I mean, even going back to his first miracle or the first, you know, the exorcism of so recognition. Yeah. Take it out of our, take this conversation out of our academic discipline, because these are not, the, these are not what, uh, most folks that are in church, um, how does this speak to the to the problems inside ourselves? I mean, so that uh, take yourself out of the biblical studies um, conversation for a minute. Just you're in church, you're coming to church to worship, and but you've got problems inside yourself th that you believe Jesus and the Triune God offer the solution to. How does this speak to those? folks. Mm -hmm. How does the salvation I, that Jesus offers to this woman's daughter and to this man, these healings, well, well one, one is a exorcism, one is a healing. How does it, how does, how do these stories speak to regular folks, spiritual problems today? I think one way is that they help us see, especially with regard to the woman and her daughter, that, that, that there's a very thin difference between faith and desperation. Mm -hmm. That faith is not necessarily having the right words to say or knowing who Jesus is, but desperation counts. And that contending against God is legit, a legitimate form of faith. I mean, I've worked on this passage before and I compare it to Jacob wrestling at the Jabbok. Um, right, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. That that, that is part of the tradition and that, that can be frustrating in some stations in life for people to hear. It can also be really empowering. Uh, and also she comes on behalf of another is I think also really empowering when I think of people who uh, are, are devastated that their children have, have walked away from the faith and they wanna come and contend uh, to God on behalf of their grandchildren or children or others, things like that, that there's, there's a way in of a Jesus who says, I mean, obviously he doesn't say, I see you from the beginning, he needs to be jolted. But then he does, and he listens, and he responds. And then she still has a final act. She still has to trust him and walk out and go home. Yeah. You know, it would be a different story if she made him come with her back to her house and said, here's my daughter, heal her. But Jesus says, taken care of, you can go now. And now she's got to figure out, do I believe this guy? You know what I mean? That there's some really interesting, complicated aspects of that. I don't know if that answers your question satisfactorily. That's where I'd start. It does. Well, I, I think uh, because in the next story too, you, they're, they're, the man is brought by others. So they're acting on behalf of mm -hmm. half of him. Um, it's just as the woman, you know, on behalf of her daughter. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I like that I, the idea of like, what does faith actually look like? Um, and that uh, yeah, desperation um, or even, you know, a kind of, um, a, a kind of persistence maybe um, it would be another way I would describe it as, uh, or, or even insistence. <laughs> uh, it also implies a kind of, you know, in terms of the wrestling with Jesus and the wrestling with God, as you mentioned, Matt, it also implies a kind of, uh, and you get that with, you know, Moses changing God's mind, right? It, and it, it, it reminds us that this relationship with God is not one-sided. It's not, um, it's not our, just our, our, our worship of God, but there is this, 
give and take in, in that relationship? And, and how often do we think about that in terms of our life of faith? Maybe that would be another, another way um, to answer your question, Rolf. You're going to yeah. you answer your own question? No, I mean, uh, I, I try. I try to ask questions that I don't have an answer to, uh, in in our podcast um, because I just learn more that way. Um, but you know, it, you know, fl f uh, flash forward to the Isaiah thirty five reading, obviously paired thematically because um, you've got the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped or are unstopped. Yeah. Um, this, uh, so in Isaiah 35, which I associate with second Isaiah um, for lots of reasons. So say to the, those who are fearful of heart, um, be strong, do not fear, here is your God. I mean, this is, so there are exiles. And so the exiles then are metaphorically cast as those who are blind, uh, deaf, lame, and uh, dumb in terms of speechless. It's, it's interesting to me that three of the four, so the metaphor is, here's a bunch of handicapped folks. Three of the four have sensory impairments, blind, deaf, and dumb, and one has a mobility impairment, lame. And what is it, uh, the, uh, announcing the salvation, this is what salvation looks like, these types of transformations. And then, and then switching, Here's another image of, of salvation. Um, places that are dry and desolate shall be watered and become lush with life. So you get these two different images of, of salvation that the prophet is using to try to kindle hope in a people who have no hope. Um, and that's one of the things preaching needs to do is preaching needs to those who have flickering hope or very little hope but it has to be uh forget that sentence wherever that was going it was going to be wrong um one of the reasons i think so many people i mean there's multiple reasons so many people with disabilities are the most unchurch people in our culture and not just in our culture but worldwide it's the miracle stories are problematic for them mm -hmm. and then access to the community of faith is very limited or completely denied. Um, and so I mean, you put those two reasons together and it, it you know, it, it's very difficult, but they need hope. They need, um, they need hope in God. And if I knew how to kindle that every week, I think I'd be better at my job. Mm. Which is a really great connection to the psalm um, and the way in which, I mean, if, the, if that's the kind of direction that you go with the, with the, the story of the Syrophoenician woman and that, you know, placing and the, and the people who bring the, the man uh, to Jesus on, on, on his behalf, that, uh, the, that you have, you know, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous. I mean, uh, and so the way in which you can use some of the language in the psalm to uh, to express that that kind of that kind of hope, and especially as you said, Rolf, for persons who are experiencing, who who are disabled, um, and uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's how I would use the psalm. And I get that emphasis on hope and on joy and on praise and on divine agent uh, divine initiative and agency here. I wonder if too what you're saying. Rolf ties into the fact that we've also got a an ornery Jesus in in Mark 7 who needs to be persuaded. In other words, there's a role like the how does the woman's agency, the Syrophoenician woman's agency or insistence carry over into how we think about what makes a healing story good news for people. You know what I mean? It's it's there's a call somewhere in here and I haven't thought this through enough or how to do it in a sermon, but somewhere in here, this pairing of texts, or actually trio of texts, is a call to the people of the church to do more. I know it's not your usual way of preaching, Rolf, but I mean, I think that, no, I, but there is a kind funny. of 
don't just sit back and wait for God to change God's mind. Actually, this is to totally act. up my alley. So switch the psalm then. I mean, I love this psalm because the psalm, do not put your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. All right. I mean, that is the psalm is like, who do you trust? Who do you love? Where's, you know, who's your God? Where do you, and Luther, whoever you fear, love, and trust the most, that's your God. Whatever you trust the most, that's your God. Switch it out for a, a prayer for help. Save Psalm 69, save me, O Lord, for the water has come up to my neck. I am drowning. Put it that there, because what I, lo I love the idea of pairing it with the story of Jacob at the Jabbok. Switch that story out, too. Uh, I've come to understand that what you love about that story is this is a great metaphor for the life of faith, wrestling with God and demanding a blessing where one is not forthcoming. What does that look like? It looks like the Psalms that are prayers for help. I mean, uh, so rather than have this psalm, which is what beautiful psalm, I love it, switch it out and say, how do you do that? Here's a text in the Bible. Save me, God. Yeah. I would, the sermon title I would give for, uh, because we've been doing sermon titles um, a couple of times in, the, in these podcasts, I would call this sermon, nevertheless, she persisted. Or how about who let the dogs out? Oh, I like mine better. Mine's funnier. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted. All right, Proverbs. More of Solomon's brilliance, right? That's why it's here, I guess. Is that why? This is some very yeah. creative choice of verses. <sighs> yeah, but it's okay. You, you, right? That is, I mean, this lines up with James. I don't uh, the, with James. Not with the lesson necessarily for this week, but with the overall thing, which is um, well, kind of God does. has put before you the, uh, you know, the way of life, uh, and, and here's what it is, whether you're rich or poor, um, and that is uh, the, the way of wisdom, the good name, I mean, that is about being a person of integrity and reputation, but especially verses, you know, look at verses eight and 22, or eight and nine and 22 and 23, you know, they talk about a, a life that is generous and shares with the poor, that doesn't sow injustice, um, and doesn't exploit the poor. I think, I mean, it's a very simple lesson, but uh, simple, not easy. So I think it goes well, actually, well, it, uh, it, with James. It, yeah, it goes great with James because that's, that, that's what we're moving into in this, in this um, second chapter of James is, uh, is this the context of the concern for the poor? And, uh, you know, what does you shall love your neighbor as yourself really look like? But if you show partiality, if you... Uh, it, it, you know, if you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes, have a seat here, or the one who is poor, you say, sit at my feet. I mean, that's, yeah, it's a great, it's a great pairing there um, between those, between those two. And that, and then again, coming out, this is where we get, as I mentioned last week, we get the verse eight, that I think is a, an important lens through which to view James and to kind of come back to, uh, of this fulfillment of the law, the doers of the word, the theology as a verb is for you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and the ways in which we distinguish ourselves from neighbor, uh, and one of those ways is rich and poor, um, and, and how we do show partiality to those around us uh, for certain uh, for certain reasons and the ways in which James is, is saying, but then what does that say about your faith? What does that say about uh, what's in your heart? And uh, so, yeah, good pairing. It's got that, you know, verse five is, is difficult. Of course, it's really important in a lot of liberation theology of, of, of God choosing the poor for us, for special attention, for a special blessing, a special option. Uh, which is worth exploring, but then also to notice what's around that verse, or especially what happens afterwards. Um, I mean, he's speaking to an audience about the poor, right? But you, letter readers, right, are guilty of dishonoring the poor. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the rich who oppress you. Like, why are you cultivating acceptance among the rich, among the powerful in your society? Uh, they're the ones who are dragging you into court. And then later on in chapter five, there's a reference to people being hired to, to work in somebody else's fields and not being paid what they were promised. You know, there's this idea of like, why are you sucking up to <laughs> the, 
the source of your oppression or to the source of injustice. And so it's not so much that there's a virtue in poverty that's some kind of, mm -hmm. you know, weird spiritual key or something like that, but it's, it's the, the image here is of a God who sees the game being played, right? Who sees all levels of the game being played and seems to, and the author seems to be saying to the audience, you know, don't you see the same game and the hypocrisy that's built in there if you aren't acting in a particular way? Which, you know, that fits almost any kind of economic or sociopolitical circumstance uh, for a wise preacher who can, who can expose a game, you know, expose the, the, the system that's at work. Uh, and then finally, verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mm -hmm. And to ask, what does that look like in practice? Mm -hmm. There's your sermon title. If you choose to preach on James, um, what does that mean from a God who's fair and a God who's also forgiving? Mm 